Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we entrust this time of this conversation to you. Help us to understand more deeply what you are doing in this great gift of the Holy <coughs> Communion. We appreciate it both intellectual, in our hearts, and put it into practice in our lives. We entrust this time to you in the hands of our Blessed Mother as we say, Hail Mary, Holy Spirit, Lord is with you. Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. In the, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. We have last talked about the Eucharist as a sacrifice, what sacrifice means, and now we're going to go into one element of that sacrifice, which is Holy Communion. I think the next several textual aspects of this. Article 26. The Eucharist is not only the memorial of Christ's sacrifice for us, but also a meal given for our nourishment. We can consider this analogy. Whatever normal bread does for our physical bodies, sated hunger, providing strength to grow, Eucharist does for our souls. So we talked about how in a sacrifice, one of the elements of many of the sacrifices, not all of them, many sacrifices included the Passover sacrifice, was part of the animal went to God, especially the parts that signified life, that signified its authority and its goodness, went to God. In part was eaten by the priest, and part was eaten by the king. It was eaten by the living provided sacrifice. This signified a union between God and man, a relationship between God and man. And so here, because the context of everything the sacrifice is not that you're going, to, you're going to keep remembering, I think on this back, it's not that during the Passover meal, Christ said, I'm going to have a Passover meal, so I'm going to have a sacrifice for you. The Passover meal was a prophecy echoing for him what Christ was doing at the last supper. So the elements of sacrifice and meal was combined together. Their echoes and expressions and explanations of what Christ is doing on the cross and the last supper. So you have a memorial sacrifice and the unit of being. And the church father upon us saying that one of the reasons why Christ shows us, comes to us the form of bread, is because he is doing for our souls what food does for our bodies. And so he nourishes us. How does Christ nourish us again? Let's see, let's see nourish our soul. What does that mean? Nourish our body and understand. What does it mean to nourish our soul? Gives us grace. Gives us grace. From what way? So nourish us. Gives grace to do what? This body of love. That's that's how he gives us to. But what's the grace for? He needs to provide the nourishment. Understand? We're not hungry anymore. We can do things. Avoid sin. I don't know. <laughs> to avoid sin. Is it just the answer? Become more holy. Become more holy. It's basically the same thing. <laughs> avoid sin. <laughs> Strength to avoid temptation. Same thing. <laughs> it is, but what one sense we're doing it, it is so it's it's giving us strength as things that aren't out there yet. It's also breaking down that bad habits and things inside of us already. Um, and so in the same way that that right to heal and nourish. Uh, it's, a, it's helping us keep from things that, that harm us and helping us strength to overcome habits. <clears throat> and then it's building us up. So this is helping us get rid of things, helping us avoid things, building us up. Well, it's your mission of menial sins. Mission of menial sins, yes. Yeah. What else? 
Hopefully to help lead others by example. Help lead others? It's a part of holding leading others? Who are we welcoming into our physical bodies? Themselves. God, yeah. And so we're spending time building friendship and we're reuniting. So it's not simply that it's this nourishment, and we're going to focus on that at this point. That's nourishment because it is a person who's with us and loves us. It's the presence of this union, coming union, with God and man. And so being God's presence, um, you know, you you sit by a fire and you get warm. You sit, you sit by the divine fire and to take on the, the aspects of the divine. You're going to be warmed by his presence. So everything else grows strength and growth and you're these things. Um, those first ones. Article 27. Now this holy food was given to us at the Last Supper. When Jesus chose the bread and the wine, the Passover meal at the elements that become his body and blood. It was also at this meal where this attackless lamb was eaten, a piece of dense memorial sacrifice. Jesus drew past the lamb of sacrifice and the cross for us in that sacrificial banquet, offers himself as food of the journey. I think we talked about this a lot last week. I can cover it a little more today, but the thing I want to say for right now is just as a when Christ offers bread and wine as a, a, a time between the sacrificial lamb and the old sacraments, it's not out of the middle of nowhere. Today, if you were to go to a Passover meal, Passover Seder meal, what you'll see is that there is a piece of a matzah. So there's a special bread of matzah, which is not that bread, uh, which is, see how it's of things. So the matzah is shared during the Passover Seder. And one of them, there's three particular ceremonial matzahs. And one of them is called the avikon. The Afikomen symbolizes three different things. It symbolizes, first of all, the manna. Second of all, the showbread. Third of all, it symbolizes the Paschal Lamb. This is the unleavened bread as a reminder of what the Hebrews ate. Their exodus. So the man that's our binder and God fed on the journey, the showbread is, is what was the temple. And these 12 loaves of bread was was kind of like almost like with like a visual lamp in front of the in front of the camp, in front of the in the icon and stuff. They put bread, these 12 loaves of bread, symbolized in the presence of the heap of the people of of Israel before, before God. But this bread was almost like this vigil lamp would be replaced every so often. And so this the bread was always in the presence of God, and the people were always in God's presence, and always with God. And so it symbolized the manna, it symbolized the people. The presence of them, it symbolized the past of the sacrifice. And so when Christ takes bread, takes the matzah, and uses it. Sit and makes his own body of blood. He's not kind of dark. I'm making it up. It is something that is part of the Hebrew culture and part of the um, significance of the, of the, of the Seder meal. Um, now, originally, of course, Christ time it was a Paschal lamb, so it didn't have that significance, but it, it was already kind of leaning toward that already. It was, it's, part of, it's part of it. So you ate it together. And so blood has appeared, this became that. So even the Jewish conception, that this is already at Christ's time, there, there was an end of that and understanding that. These two definitely would have been there at Christ's time. This would get there about 100 years later. Um, and so if Christ has taken elements that would have been understood by the apostles, by the Jewish people, by those who were there, and so he, he does, again, it's not just he's, here's the bread, by the way, what symbolizes this, it's, 
been preparing for the last couple thousand years or more. Questions? Number 28. We can therefore refer to the altar of sacrifice as the table of the Lord, to the Mass as a banquet that is prepared for us, with the understanding it's not an ordinary meal. Just as the Passover was not an ordinary meal, but rather a banquet accompanying a sacrifice, so the Mass is not just a meal, or just a gathering of friends and family. It is rather the memorial of banquet that accompanies the sacrifice of Christ. Holy sacrifice of the Mass has both the sacrifice and the spiritual nourishment. Why is the bishop emphasizing that there is some truth to this, but also that he's also talking about the error? What error is he talking about uh, in this era? In many places, of course, especially in the 70s, it became common to emphasize the meal aspect. The uh, common to emphasize the fact that here we were God's children eating together, and the one to focus upon the people coming together as friends and really nice to each other. And we lose, if you don't keep them in context, just think we come together, have a meal together, symbolically, and just be friends together. And that's the communion. That's, that's, that's where you begin. And this is a whole lot. Constant of the legal presence. Constant of the legal presence. And where is the union come from, or where is our relationship with God come from? The relationship with God doesn't come from must be friends. It's not that we were such great people, so we're good with each other. God came down to us and said, I'm going to save those people there's a whole. We're stinkers. <laughs> and God came to us that we were stinks, we were self-centered. And it begins with God's work, and God's sacrifice, and then when we're forgiven, we enter a communion with Him. And God seals us by giving us His flesh, which we join together to meet and worship and celebrate together. And so we can't be united to each other until we're first united to God. It's only when we're healed by God we can be united to each other again. It's one of the problems with this conception of the Mass, there's many problems, is that it makes salvation be from us and about us and leading back to us. And then it makes the Mass simply be this symbolic thing, which is even less important than Passover. You know, it's, we could have had a potluck dinner, you know, why are we having, you know, this? And that's all. So it's not, not even the best bread, it's not even the greatest great, great wine. wine. So it's, it's a symbolic meal. And so the point is, is, is that it, it is a sacrificial bank. It is this accompanying thing where we're coming back to God, lying to God, being forgiven of our sin, but that has to be with the blood. And the forgiveness of sins and your healing, but then we can be united with each So it is a table, it is a meal, not that first. First, the same as a sacrificial banquet, and at first, is a sacrifice. Then God feeds us, nourishes us, brings us to, to, to Himself, to each other. So it's both a sacrifice and spiritual nourishment. The Eucharist is sacrifice and sacrament. These two things, these two aspects of accepting people? What about people? There's a difference between the sacrifice and the sacrament that makes sense to people. These two terms. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just going to make a comment. Please. That, um, why is it different? <laughs> and we have our little, our little wafer of some sort, a little thing of wine passed, you know, person to person. 
but um, it was considered a sacrament. And you look at a lot of the Protestant songs, it says gathered around the table of God type thing. Right. And not, 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 not significant to the sacrifice itself. Yeah, because many Protestant conceptions of, of the meeting of, of Sunday is we're, we're praising God by song. Right. And that's it. Well, so the word, the, the word the word of God. You're right. Yeah. You're right. The word of God. But there's no, no concept of sacrifice, no concept of uh, uh, it's simply we're celebrating a past event. Right. As that's opposed to no that's why no corpus, and that's why it's, it's we're, we're remembering and celebrating the past event, but we're not taking part of it, we're not worshiping God in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's a little different understanding of what's going on. Yeah. Unfortunately, that does remind me, I attended Mass in Sierra Vista a few years ago, so maybe it's not the same anymore. But what she describes, during communion, they actually did use little cups and little pieces of bread, more like a hors d'oeuvre tray. Yes. It exactly. was very was odd. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also good. For reasons. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure they've been corrected. I hope so. <laughs> Hopefully it was one priest who had, who had a mental breakdown and he since her kind of like the how the what year was that? That's what she was saying. Yeah. What, what year was that? Oh, uh, probably two thousand three ish, two thousand Well that was in Kincanis? Was uh, it Bishop Kincanis? I I don't think it was a bishop, but it was at the church there in Sierra Vista. Yeah. But I mean he would be able to see the I was just visiting. <laughs> I remember going to the Newman Center in UNM about 10 years back. I think this has since changed, but um, there was a group of priests there who would have the students gather around the altar, hold hands, and pass around the Eucharist. Um, I've also seen the diction, and that's not, shouldn't Self medication, and all that stuff. <laughs> It's very easy to say we shouldn't do it. It's not we should do. <laughs> <laughs> Article 29. So one of the best ways to understand this is the Lord's Prayer. Which begs the Father to give us this day our daily bread. The Catechism of the Catholic Church summarizes well these important words, what these important words mean. So daily bread, daily Epiusius occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. That in some ways is a deep word to the hour fall. Taken in the temporal sense, the word is a pedagogical repetition of this, of this day to confirm us in trust without reservation. Taken in the qualitative sense, it signifies the necessary for life, or broadly every good thing sufficient for subsistence. Taken literally, epiusius, super essential. For it's directly to the bread of life, the body of Christ, the vessel of mortality, that which gave our life within us. By this connection, its heavenly meaning is evident. This day is the day of the Lord, the day of the feast of the kingdom anticipated in the Eucharist, so ready to foretaste the kingdom to come. This reason is fitting for the Eucharist liturgy to be celebrated each day. Greek is a, just the Hebrew is a unique language that's all special characteristics. So is Greek. And Greek is, you might say, a 3D language. Because not only does the individual words matter, there's so much contextual stuff that, that, that matters. Um, there's a reason why the Greeks were poets, and the Romans are lawmakers. <laughs> uh, Latin is, 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 is the words mean what they mean. Greek, the words have many letters. And so the, the Greek Bible, which was the, the version we have, the oldest version we have, the Our Father, um, the word it be used epousis, which is several layers of meaning. <coughs> so it can mean simply every day. It can mean everything. It can mean the bread of all things. Jesus Christ. And these things that point together to eternal life. To heaven. Yeah. 
And so this one little word is very, very rich. And so we're, we're told here by the bishop is that when we think, hear the word, give us daily day or daily bread, this is the banquet that we're talking about. The sacrificial banquet that we participate in at the Mass. Contains all of these elements of meanings. We come to God for just our ordinary daily needs. You know, Christ says in the Gospel of Matthew, you know, come to do with your needs. Your Father in heaven knows you need, you need clothing and food and comfort and those things. So we're coming to the needs saying, Lord, help us. We're coming to him without just. Literally, food are coming to everything. We're recognizing God is again our Father, and, and so it's not just one aspect we can give everything. And the word can be the bread of all things, the super substantial, the super essential, the which is the Eucharist. So then, and then it points to heaven because in part of that nourishment again, nourishing us for eternal life. It's making us grow toward God, grow toward each of God. You that begins here in Eucharist is that perfected and fulfilled and determined. Right? So, so what's happening is that there is a beginning of union and communion and unity with God, which grows throughout our life until it's perfected and completed in heaven. This, this is the this little, little word and all those things put all the same God. It's only time it happens. Only time that this word is used in the entire Testament. Number 30, you just emphasize this and reiterates it another way. Thus, even while there are few to understand this phrase, the primary, most exalted way, in other words, is the first word that we get it. You don't get this first, otherwise I'll include it. This is really what we're praying for, primarily. The reference to the bread of Christ's flesh is given to us in the Eucharist. This helps us to make sense of Christ's actions in the Last Supper. He chose bread as something that can be eaten daily, and changed the bread to himself so that it can be our heavenly, super essential subsistence. He's helping us become so. In this regard, we must say, consider the Eucharist as our daily bread. <clears throat> Helps to stir our up missionary impetus in our hearts. Just as we should have a love for Christ, strive to provide the hunger with their daily bread, so they may not starve. So we strive to spread the Catholic faith of those who have it, those who are hungry for truth and goodness, so they can have their share of the super essential bread with us, no Christ in the Eucharist. But simply, the Eucharist is both sort of the poor and that relation. The closer we are to Christ, the more we're going to do what Christ did. And Christ in this life both took care of those who need He healed the sick, He fed the hungry, He keep cured, about doing good. But most importantly, he went about teaching and working salvation. And so when we're united to Christ, we're going to act like Christ and do what Christ did. And so we will, of course, help the poor by giving them food. We're also make sure that people, sometimes there are people who are poor who have lots of money. Sometimes the most poverty-stricken people in the world have lots of good things. They, 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 they're Start. Oh, it's recently, yeah. And so one of the things that we're called to do then is to recognize that we're not here to hoard this banquet. Christ all to provide, all to provide for us. But to help other people enter into it. If you love other people, you're going to help them. There's an interesting interview with an atheist that I saw. His name is Penn Gillette. Uh, he's a magician. Atheist. 
And some of you said, I suspect his next pattern, that's not the story. <laughs> so this growth was born with that next pattern. I suspect, I, I can't prove it. Um, but he, he tells the story, he's, he's deeply involved in tears. Um, you can find it online, where, where he's given a gift of the Bible, a Bible. And he says in this interview, said, you know, someone, you know this, this man gave me the Bible, and he says, so, he said, I want to give him this Bible, this gift, I appreciate all you've done, all, all the entertainment. He was very appreciative of it. And he says, he said, I've never agreed with somebody not an animal. He's an atheist, right? He's an atheist saying, you know, because if you really think that I'm going to go to hell, or, or at least stop some good things in heaven because of, because of what I believe, how much do you have to hate me not to help me out? He said, you know, if I was in the road and there was a truck going to hit me, you would come and yell at me and push me out of the way. He says, this is even worse. He says, I really appreciate it. I never agreed with someone not, not, not proselytizing or not spreading the word of God. He said, no, yeah, I don't believe it. But the fact is, this guy gave me this Bible, and he's a good man, I feel like he did. Atheist. He gets it more than one cash. Um, <laughs> you pick off camera? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, But yeah, no, I mean, so, so we're called to teach, to spread, and have other people to come and know our Lord. Questions? Truck along really quickly today. Um, come to know our Lord or come to know the Catholic faith. Do the same thing. <laughs> right? Because it, it, the Catholic faith it is Christ revealing himself. Right. In order to truly know him as he wants to be known, it needs to be kept. That's true. It's just some people. Yes, that is true. People don't always recognize that. But yes. Uh, the, the, the Catholic Church is the true faith and the true church. And so you can't know Christ the way he wants to be known if you don't That was God being good and being kind recognizes when we make mistakes or can't do that. And we'll fill the gaps. But if we're doing our best, it's very different than someone who doesn't give a darn. Whether you're Catholic or not practicing, whether you're of religion. But yes, no, there is one faith, one truth, that there is one God who is true. That was your comment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Article 32. This article may slow us down a little bit. We'll see. Pope Paul VI is a sickle called Mysterium Fidium. There was at least eight ways the Christ is present to us in the church. Mm. His presence are real and to be venerated by the faithful. And they include where two or three are gathered in his name, the various works of mercy that the church performs in his name. His presence, the word of God, is the sacraments. Let me stop there, because I think this is something that's very confusing. We hear that God is present. It's different ways that God is present. Confusing to us because, because I think in ordinary language we use the term present to mean only one thing. <laughs> Someone's physically here, but we're not physically here. And they're talking about different kind of ways of being present, this sounds very strange to us. And so people either get confused into thinking that the Eucharist isn't truly real. Or that the Bible, or that the, the Christ presence in other ways is just the same thing as the Eucharist. Let's begin then with just talking about what's what's our thoughts. Um, so by analogy, there's different ways to be present in this converse, this conversation, that in this yeah, you can physically hear, or be playing on your cell phone. You're present. If you're not present, now you're not paying attention. You're falling asleep because I'm bored, whatever. You know, you're present, but you're not present. 
there's a reason why you want to have a conversation with somebody, you want them to put down what they're doing and stop what they're doing and talk to you. Why are you special, right? Uh, traditionally, well, not traditionally, um, God is omnipresent. God's everywhere. There are three ways this happens in everything, and there are additional ways it happens in the soul. That's your soul sanctifying rights. The way it happens our way as well. But they begin to hear how us understand what Paul's in Paul is talking So the three ways the present is by presence, which is sounds kind of like a repetition, but it's not by power and by essence. Now if I remember these terms, I think it is me. <clears throat> when these classics talk about the spoilers of the Christic present, not being present everywhere by its presence, the fact is all things are in his sight. All things present to him. He sees all things. Nothing is hidden from him. Um, so in the same way that you all can see this marker is present to you. Not just because it's physically here in the same room with you, but that you can notice it and see it. God sees all things. <clears throat> He's present by his power as a king. If you're in a kingdom, where does the king rule? Mm -hmm. The entire kingdom. Yeah. Right? There's not a place where he has a rule. As you see, that's what makes him king. So his power, his, his rule, his authority, his ability to make laws, rules, and everything else is standing the entire place. Now he himself is a man, he's not, he's not physically everywhere, but he's present everywhere by his power. So God's rules and king stands everywhere and everything. And by that sense, then as he creates all things and sustains all things, he keeps them in existence, he keeps them real, he keeps them not fading away, away nothingness. It's so because he is literally holding everything in existence, nothing can be hidden from it. He's not, he's not there, he's not, he's not, nothing is going to be too much for him. He's not going to lose count. He's not going to forget that, that, that he made some, someone new or something new. So he's going to create them all. In a very real way, this is similar, so omnipresence is similar to eternity. The eternity is God inside of time. That the God is beyond time. And so there's no beginning and middle and end for God. God just is. God being everywhere is God is beyond space. There's no distance with God. There is no... As soon as you can break something down into parts and pieces, it comes to that. When something is beyond and above and larger than that space itself, see greater than time, greater than space, then it's everywhere. So this is about how God's present to us ever in all things. Now we're not saying that everything is God. This is not God, we're not pantheists. We're not saying that God somehow is oozed out of our being. Or that we're out of God's being somehow. We're not pantheists, where we become God and God becomes us, or that. But we do believe that God is everywhere. We can approach God and meet with God 
But though God is everywhere, He is easy. Everywhere in different ways. Because the, the soul of the just man, God dwells by holiness and by love, but He does not dwell in the soul of the unjust man. Even though He's present there by power and by essence, not present there by love and by evil. So far, so good. I'm just going to make a comment Please. that um, some people say, well, God is in the forest, let's say. I don't need to go to church. He's, he's right. there. He's everywhere. And that's true as far as it goes. Yeah. But <laughs> he's not present in the same way in the forest yeah. as he is in you. And that's part of this. <laughs> when it comes to Christ being present, I'm going to pull this up now, read to you what Pope Paul VI says, the ways that Christ is present to his church. This may be a similar, this may be a kind of similar thing, where there are real presences, but they're not the same thing as we think about in your presence. It's just, we're talking about his power, his authority, his union are real in more ways. And so don't let that, 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 that so what I'm trying to say is don't let us, that, that this confusion about the Eucharist then it being even more in awe about how God's goodness to us and present to us. So this isn't a attack on the Eucharist, it's simply saying Christ is more for us, is with us in, in more ways than we recognize. So this is Article 35 of the Meeting. All of us realize there is more than a way of Christ present in this church. I want to go into this very joyful subject, which the Vatican Council said briefly, some of our length. Christ is present in this church when she prays. He is the one who prays for us and in us to whom we pray. He prays for us as our priest, he prays for us as our head, he's prayed to us by us, he's prayed to by us as our God. He is the one who to whom his promise, which we're here gathered together in my name. And they're the midst of them. So Christ is present when we pray. Because what gives our prayer value? Sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is our prayer value. A sanctifying grace, we can't pray to each other. The presence of the Holy Spirit helps us pray. So the united to Christ. That's us pray as we should. So every time we pray, we're praying as we should, we are praying to Christ. We're receiving his grace, we're receiving his life in us, we're receiving his help. Pray. This is why Christ can say, we're two or three gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now again, this is not saying the attack of the Eucharist, it's just saying the attack of Christ does more for us than we realize. He's present in the church as he performs her works of mercy. Uh, just because whatever good we do for at least for do for Christ himself. But also because Christ wanted to perform these works of the church and it simply helps man with his divine love. Right, so again, through the sanctifying grace, Christ inspired us. Christ guides us, Christ leads us, Christ helps us to do what we're supposed to do for each other. And then Christ accepts it as done for himself. He's present with the church, he moves along the pilgrimage. They're longing to reach the pores of eternal life. For he dwells in our hearts through faith, as those sharing that the Holy Spirit who gives gives to us. Through faith, hope, and charity, which is a union. Christ, of sharing in Christ's knowledge, Christ's vision, and Christ's love himself. There are other ways present in the church as she preaches. Because the gospel which she proclaims is the word of God. Only in the name of Christ, the incarnate word of God, and by his authority and with his help, she is preached. To every one flock, skirt, and shepherd. 
but the truth that is being given only is about Christ, but it's Christ for and Christ's truth bringing us to Christ. He is present in the church in her rule as she governs and guides the people of God. Their sacred power comes from Christ, since Christ, chapter shepherds, is present in the bishop who exercise the power to keep the promise made with the apostles. So he guides the church, helps her, and keeps her from falling away. The individuals might fall away, even poor individuals, but the church might fall away. So by like the magisterium? Mag uh, the magisterium, but also, yeah, yeah magisterium. Yes. Um, he's present in the sacraments. <coughs> uh, because they come from him, they're given by him, and they lead us back to him. <coughs> He's fed us in the sacrifice, and they're the sacrament. Sacrifice in us, and in the Holy Eucharist. So what the, by saying these are real things to venerate their knowledge, again, we're not saying they're all the same thing. We're not saying they're equal, we're not saying that it's that, that sad. It's just because the same word presence is used, don't, be, don't, don't conflate them and say they're the same thing or not. But all we're saying is that God loves us and comes to us in a variety of ways. God loves us comes in ways we can understand and reach and reach by us. Most important is it is going to be his true presence, which is where he's present physically and literally and body, blood, soul, and minute. All of these are real. And all of these are recognition. And all of these are adoration. Not adoration. Only, a, only the Eucharist and the sacrifice to which is offered to the Eucharist is adoration. Right, so it's physically present. These all deserve veneration, recognition, understanding, awe, <laughs> love for God and for us. This is a person. This is a person's actions. This is what Christ does. These are actions. This is a person himself. Very, very important difference. St. Paul has said continued. <laughs> there is another way in which Christ is present in his church, but it surpasses all the others. It is present in the sacrament of the Eucharist, which is for this reason a more consoling source of devotion, a lovely element of contemplation, holier than what it contains all other sacraments. And baptism is really important, right? Say it. Confession is really important for our sins. The priesthood is important. Mary is important. None of those are worth anything for the Eucharist. The Eucharist again, a person. <laughs> In the Eucharist, we come to Christ, to visit Christ, talk with God, sit with God, be with God, receive God. Other sacraments are truly bring us to God and are great acts of grace. In fact, it's helped us to live the life we're supposed to. We venerate them, we love them, we recognize them, His goodness to us, Eucharist we adore, because it truly is Jesus Christ. It's profound. It's incredible. It's all about it, what God's done for us. It's all about it. No, it's, we, are, we are drowning in a mountain of riches. We have the overabundance of God's riches to live to us. The priest used to have a novel um, at Magnet Conception. He wrote a book of The Gift Beyond Compare. I thought that was an appropriate title. Yeah, absolutely. All right, source and something is the person. Yeah. So Christ has found a way to be in heaven and apart from us, and yet remain with us. And to be with us individually and personally, and to be in us a way that none of us knows. Not even the smallest child to be frightened of this. Everyone can approach him, everyone can be consoled by him first. 
Stop. Tikit apa ni? Tikit apa ni? Saint Nicholas has called the pets of you for his real. Not because others are not real, because it is substantial and do it through Christ becomes present whole entire God man. The Eucharist is therefore the presence of Christ for excellence. A presence of nothing in the world, else in the world is the See, all of these things we, we, we can kind of understand, this, this we have to recognize is something very different. This is the discipline of the Eucharist. It's God. And it's also man. This is the same Jesus who spoke with us, who walked with us, who died for us, who preached to us, who lives with us. He's right there. I did a pilgrimage a few years ago we went to Siena. And there was in Siena. And there was a miracle here. Christian miracle there where thieves had broken in, stole the Samorium, dumped the host, consecrated host, into a pool box at a church. And they sat there for a few days before they realized that they were, they were there. They brought them back and you know, started you know, trying to take care of them and stuff. Well, that's been 200 years ago. And they had given use some of the fourth million. And then they, as time went on, it was like they're not breaking down. And so it was like, we're, we need to set this aside. Something's going on. So we go to the pilgrimage, you know, on this pilgrimage, and I had asked them, you know, the directors, I said, can we go see this? Because it wasn't on the itinerary. Mm -hmm. And so we went, and they had brought him out and exposed the monster and said, all these hosts are in. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to walk out, and everybody was very excited. I had my camera, and I got all the way up there. People were taking pictures, and I got up there, and I'm within five feet of it. And I couldn't take a picture. Mm -hmm. It was God. Mm -hmm. And then I just... <laughs> yeah, but it's, a, it's a beautiful of all these miracles, but don't forget, and lack of the experience, right? That you recognize he's not a tourist attraction. So no. This is my Lord. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you are. Yeah, I'm the dog dad. It's not a tame lion to keep in a zoo. He's, 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 <laughs> he's not a tame lion. But the, but the fact is that. Even though the Eucharist doesn't bleed in church in this Mass, even though the Eucharist doesn't float in the air, there's a light in the Eucharist, even though, <laughs> same thing. The miracle is just as profound, just as real, just as true. And this time, I'm right. Every day, the Mass is here. Bread becomes God. You can receive God, meet with God, walk. It's a miracle. There's a story of St. Simon of Montfort, not at least of Montfort, Simon of Montfort, an ancestor, um, where he was a, a monk in a monastery in France. And he was sweeping out the floors, he was told to sweep the, the patio. And suddenly in the church, there the, the, appeared the Eucharist, the monastery, and Christ. And the other ran to him and said, Simon, Brother Simon, quick, quick. Our Lord's appeared in the Eucharist. He said, well, I was given this task by our Lord to sweep the floor. I'll come and look when I finish. If he's still looking that way, I would love to see it. If he's not, I'm going to make less. And all this kind of credit made less. So the same one. That's the big one. Where should it, should it be? I mean, thought that doesn't make any difference to human beings than course the Probably that. If I saw the pressure up here, the first time, probably more excited, of course. 
But hopefully we'll have a faith where we're just excited as seeing the, the tabernacle. We're, we're just recognizing the same way that just because he looks different, because he bleeds or really flows, or because of light, still the same Jesus. We should be just as reverent and venerating and love and awe and joy. Joy at who's there. You know what happens? Right. Spicy on the cake. Icing on the cake. <laughs> icing on the cake. Spicy on the cake would be very nice. Icing on the cake. It's icing on the cake. But the real miracle is really present. There. What I find interesting too is when you have satanic uh, people who unfortunately you know, in confirmation against the Eucharist, they believe Absolutely. that Jesus is there. And that's why they, they do that. The demons believe in trouble. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean the, the if if you look at the devil's work, it's gonna attack the priest, it's gonna attack him. Because if he gets rid of those two things, other people, people won't stand up. People won't stand up. You have the Bureau of Stories of Japan or the last or in Maine, where there were 50, 200, more than that. Years ago, there was no priest, there was no mass. But there was a Catholic culture, there were isolated people in all those cases. They were, they passed on the faith, the secret of hidden. But in most cases, what happens is people won't if you stop believing, if you start believing the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is no different than the presence of Christ in the Bible. Well, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is no different than the presence of Christ and us gathered together here talking about, about God. Well, why bother God? If you're not being fed daily, what's going to happen? You get sick. If you're not being fed daily, you're going to get weak, you're going to die, you're going to starve. Give your soul. And, and so yes, we have all these other ways to, to, to be nourished, to be fed, but this is so different. Well, the difference is between you know reading about God, sitting in your way, and being touched by God, and being friends with God, and being with God. These are all things God does, and so it comes to us in really true ways, beautiful ways, amazing ways. This is God Himself. Adoration, respect, all love, adoration, worship, awe. It's why we need it. It's why we always say. When I uh, gave the eulogy for my mother's funeral last year, um, this in the Lutheran church, it just seems so empty. You know, there's just, there's obviously something, to me, something missing, you know, in the tabernacle. But like, I'm so used to kneeling before I go up to the steps. Mm -hmm. As long as you're also doing it like you're in a movie theater or coming off your couch or something. Yeah. So you're used to doing so. Then you're flanking random places. <laughs> when we did our baccalaureate um, church service from high school, there were three of us that were Catholic. The person in front of me knelt, and I was like, I have to kneel in here. <laughs> we were in some kind of, I don't even know, some Protestant church. <laughs> it's just weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I get so used to, because I live here, right? So every time I, I leave and we're going where I'm past the Eucharist, I always take side of the cross and I leave. It comes several times where I've been like at my parents' house where I would play around. Wait, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Not in the church. Just blessing it. <laughs> it's a prayer, it's a prayer. <laughs> but that's something I realize we should do whenever we go by yeah. right by Catholic Church, make a sign of the cross. Yeah. I have to be honest with you, I, I have neglected doing that. <laughs> Sometimes if there's a non like my sister with me or a non crossed friend with me, I may say it was something to myself. I think I'm saying it. 
think you know exactly what I, what I would say, and so I'm going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Number 33. Let me present maps in absolute terms. The Eucharist does not simply represent Jesus in the way the past lamb represents Jesus. He is not present in the U.S. sacrament as a symbol. No, the U.S. sacrament is the body, blood, soul, and many of Jesus Christ. It is he who is truly, who is substantially present in the sacrament. These three terms, truly, really, substantially, um, are very important terms. And they, they come from the Council of Trent. And they answer various heresies about the Eucharist. So he's not present simply in a symbol, in the, in the way that you would say that this picture is my son. No, that's not, it's a picture, literally it's not him. Not, he's really truly present. He's not present simply by us. He's acting through the Eucharist, but he acts in baptism. You know, he's say Christ present in baptism because he's the one who's through the baptism, he's the one who's saving the soul. But he's really present. And he's present substantially, not simply in the bread, among the bread, or by the bread, as a bread of the no more. Really substantial. So these are deliberate terms being chosen. We're going back to Council Trump. Additionally, in the present in the bread and wine, since after consecration, the bread and wine won't exist. Just as in the incarnation, humanity was hid as divinity, so too in the consecration, the appearance of bread and wine high as glory once more. We are for the Eucharist, then, we are for a miraculous of that mystery. For even though we see and taste the appearance of bread and wine, we are, in fact, in the very presence of God. So this is one of those things, too, where we can spend the rest of our life talking about this one subject. I can explain it in one, one word, one sentence. Or you can say, it looks like bread is Jesus. All you know. We can spend the rest of our life breaking down, talking about what that means and how to apply it on the life. Let's talk this briefly about this word substance, which is transubstantiation. Because it, it uses Greek philosophical terms, which unfortunately a lot of us aren't familiar with very much anymore. Uh, so we'll think that way. But it's important that at least you know, at least, at least briefly, these, uh, what this means. <laughs> Accidents and substance. Have you come across these terms, accidents and substance, um, in your past reading or study on the universe? No. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> so, if we can start, start with it, but then now, if you were going to Hatch an egg. You've got your chicken egg and you put it in the incubator and you hatch the egg. And then it starts out with this little yellow chick and it's peeping around and then it grows with its feathers and it gets to be a pullet, it gets to be an adult with slight more eggs. Is it the same chicken that was hatched that is now the yellow chicken? Yes. Yeah. Not your question. It's much yeah. But the same chick, right? So yeah. not a man, the same thing. But something, so some things stay the same, but a lot of them are different. So the accidents are the things that can change, and the underlying reality. So size, shape, color. A position, these are things that are accidental to the reality. By the chick, I get bigger, I'm still me. 
<laughs> I go in the sun, I get sunburned, I change color. I'm still me. I sit down or I stand, I'm still me. There are nine of these accents that we're to find out as we're all In every case, though, that the reality changes the same, even though it looks very different. The chicken as the chick or the, or the unhashed egg, now the woman chicken look very, very different. But it's the same underlying value, it's the same, the same thing. If you look at a host that took a piece of bread that comes from the Eucharist, that before the Mass, took it out, gave it, showed it to you, passed it around. The substance is bread. The accidents are the accidents of that host are it looks like bread. Acts like bread, tastes like bread, feels like bread. Everyone understands it says bread, and the substance is bread. With most things, these were together. Right, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Active and substance. Usually, what we know are things in our senses. We don't know, normally, we know what the accents size, shape, color, position. Helps to under, that helps you figure out what the reality is. In the Eucharist, though, at a certain moment, the priest takes the bread and the wine, the consecration, and is over the words of Christ. This is my body, this is my body. And a miracle happens. There is a change of substance, a transpantiation. The substance changes. The reality changes. The accidents remain. But the substance is no longer what it was. So it tastes like bread, it looks like bread, it feels like bread, it acts like bread, but no longer is bread. It's Jesus. And so the accident, by a miracle, are availing the kind of accidents. I think before part of this. I'll try it briefly because two bots they ignore it. Because this does kind of rely upon lots of philosophy. And so it's, it's not that important. But it, it is important to try something more. Take a breath of time. Oh, I'm digging a hole over here. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, I'll throw in some big words and the people will think I'm, I'm smart. <laughs> Confused about people, I don't know what you know we're talking about. <laughs> One of the miracles that happens in the Eucharist. See, the actions of this, this white the, the shape, the size, the color, they have to actually exist, be bound to the substance of the white <coughs> The acts and substance go together. If I take the chicken and, and I nuke it, not only does the substance go, so the actions. <laughs> <laughs> and most things, except for one, <coughs> something's not going to school together. I can't get rid of this up without the actions. By a miracle in the Eucharist, the accidents don't <coughs> adhere, don't remain, don't stick to the ordinary subject, but instead are bound and crossed. So the miracle is, there's the accidents of bread there, or wine, that do not have their ordinary subject, bread and wine. It's a miracle, it's something that doesn't happen in any other rights. Every time they back there, they give some substance, they're going to go together. And so this is a veiling of Christ's presence. Because all the way that Christ is there is by, is by the accidents. Even though the accidents aren't really what the substance is. And so it's a unique, miraculous thing. 
Um, and why should we care? Because what Christ did a couple of things for us. One what he's doing is he is saying to us, I'm going to come to the way you can understand and grasp. I'm going to come to you in a way you can receive and take hold. I'm going to come to you in a way that means something to me. I'm going to come to you small and helpless. And I want you to have faith and to see beyond the veil. When Christ asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? Who is on God, or God himself? What is Christ's first response? Blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood, the appearances, have a told you this. My Father in heaven is born. This happens in the Eucharist. The appearances will tell us that it's Jesus. Faith tells us that, the Lord tells us that. Our work has told us that, but we don't have these outward signs. And so the Thomas Aquinas says, in this case, normally we trust the senses, in this case, we trust is Christ's work more than our senses. Because Christ has said, this is my body, this is my blood. And by that trust, by that faith, we can be closer to Christ and hold a communion than the apostles were as they walked through the dusty roads. They didn't receive in their hearts. They didn't have a brother in their souls. He was there nourishing them and feeding them in the same way. You can be closer in the Holy Communion than the apostles were at the Sermon on the Mount when he chose them. Because of this presence of Christ, he's not doing it. Isn't that my God? Yes. <laughs> And I guess there's multiple layers to this. During the, in the parish hall, when we had the display with uh, various Eucharistic uh, miracles mm -hmm. and the little uh, posters on them, uh, some of the ones that stuck out to me were uh, where the Eucharist appeared as uh, heart tissue. Right. And yet, when it, reading into uh, that a little bit, they were saying it was still veiling the miracle of the Eucharist itself. Uh, in multiple layers, yes, it was heart tissue, but it was only, I guess, the yeah, accidents yes. Yes. of heart tissue. It was still. Um, yeah, that case was also living heart tissue, right? right. Yeah. 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 So, so it, yeah, it was multiple layers. Yeah. Was it AB? Yeah, AB, AB positive, I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but, but, all, but all more than that, it was, it was the, the, uh, the proteins in the blood break down very quickly. You want to show them on the Yeah, it shows it was stressed. Yeah. Showing it was stressed, or showing it was living. Yeah, it's still, yeah. It was uh, still healing. It was still trying to repair itself. So, so, so that's, it's, it's not, yeah, yes, but it's the substance. It is the full price, not just the smart nature. Yeah. So in this case, the accidents of the miracles was changed from being the accidents of red wine, the accidents of heart tissue or blood or but substance was changed. Um, just as a pop quiz, give me your guess. Um, make sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, it's not there yet. Uh, so, how long does Christ remain in the Eucharist? So, how long does the Eucharist remain Christ? Let me use the word and because like that's all the right word. How long does the Eucharist remain Christ after consecration? Forever. Eternity? About 10 minutes, say, but here after it's been consumed, you I mean, after consumption, or in the temple, or after it's either of those. <laughs> <laughs> it would be still the same once, you once it's consecrated, isn't it? It remains Jesus, it remains Jesus so long as the accidents don't corrupt. So, right. so if it's dissolved, but it can live in your body. The accidents have corrupted, they've been dissolved. If, it's, if um, God forbid, somewhere to consume it and throw it up, it would put it in water and it dissolved, it was dissolved, it's dissolved, it's Jesus. 
or put in five and burn up along Jesus. So we have to do that if we get sick on Sunday afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> if we throw up the Eucharist and it is still is visibly present in the Eucharist, yes. Well. We're jumping in all the characters. <laughs> 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 you no, know, it's a for you, know, okay. where we had some of the little girl who came and she kind of sat up and down over her shirt. Uh, it was kind of half shoe, so we had to take care of it and soak the shirt. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, but if it's three couple hours later, it's no one can't tell anymore. It's one of Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or the uh, well, the precious blood is of Jesus, but on the on the corporal, or on the on the uh, scripture, excuse me, it's a cloth. I'm wiping it up after it dries. It's on the wall. It's on the wall. The actors are wiping it. But it was dry. It was a stain. Not one of Jesus. Uh, please, please. Uh, and so forever I've wondered when you're performing or doing the consecration at that moment and uh, I remember scenes from World Youth Day so different size of events so you have the wine and water and then you have the chalice how far does the miracle spread does the wine in the little bottle of the curates also undergo? So it, it, it's, it's the intention of the priest. Um, and so my intention is not to consecrate those. Okay. Um, and so nor normally it's because we're human beings, it's going to be what you see, because it's what you're thinking of. If there was something hidden off the sacristy and not want to attend it, but even if there was, you know, I meant to bring it to the board, but it was left accidentally on the table, or do I intend to consecrate that? So normally it's what I see, but it's my intention. So, so if halfway through the Mass, I go, oh shoot, I brought it over, I'm going to concentrate it in here, I can do it. That wouldn't be the best thing to do because it would confuse people, but I could do it. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. God in this case is said I'm going to depend upon the intention of my priest. And so I'll give you one better. Suppose I'm going to be a real jerk and decided, I want to give you the Eucharist today. I'm only going to concentrate my post in front of Guess what? I can do that. Mm -hmm. um, that would that'd be a grave scam and a grave sin, but I can do it. Um, where priests have happened to do it um, is where priests commit a mortal sin and is embarrassed and can't go to confession, and doesn't want to not say Mass. Well, first of all, he's told to say Mass and confession afterwards because the people need the Eucharist. But priests have been tempted before and had before, so I'm going to only pretend to say the Mass, so we'll know that way, we we'll confession afterwards. But then what are you doing? You're causing idolatry, you're, you're pretending a sacrament, it, it's a grave, grave sin. Oh. But, but yes, the, the intention of the priest matters. Um, so, but normally what you're told is it should be all the corporal. It's a sign of reverence, love, and so you don't forget it's there and not consecrated. How about World Youth Days where they have backpacks of... <laughs> well, hopefully the intention of this is going to be to consecrate those. It's normal, that's why you have the 500 Zaboria, or whatever they are, and then the bishops loose and say, okay, those are, the, those are the ones that are there. Yeah. And one bishop will see them, but this other one will see them. <laughs> but okay. it can also be kind of a general intention as well. It doesn't have to be seeing every single host, okay. um, as, as long as the intention is there. And if you tell the bishop, well, to consecrate this, you can't say, well, this power balance them because we didn't intend it. So, more importantly, it's going to be what's on the altar when you see, but you could intend other things. Uh, because even though I'm not everywhere, God is. Cool. So, some of accidents, transubstantiation, that's what we're talking about. So, it looks like bread, but it's Jesus. It looks like wine, but it's Jesus. One last verse, then we'll article. Last verse. What's the article? <laughs> and then we'll we'll end the day. What was that? I said that's okay. You can <laughs> Sure. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. uh, since Christ present in the Eucharist, God is truly present. This means the beginning of the sacrament, the worship, and the adoration that we give to God alone. These especially the liturgies when we kneel and genuflect only before the sacrament. These are possible due to God, only to God, as signs of adoration. These were, in fact, the 
apostles were the Magi when they came to know the newborn Christ child. Five cycles after the resurrection. Some of these of incense, mentioned times, was used only in worship of the divine. We recognize the Christ's presence in the Eucharist. And we worship and adore the Eucharist because it's God, Jesus. And we show this by the gesture of the signs, by the way we act in church, we dress in church, that we treat the Eucharist. And if we don't treat the Eucharist that way, what we're saying is don't believe it. Even if we believe in our mind, we don't believe in our hearts. So we want to make certain that because this is truly Jesus Christ, looks like bread, it acts like bread, tastes like bread, but it's God Himself. That we unveil His presence to people by how we speak, how we act, how we treat the church and His presence. See, if I'm going to church and I'm there as a priest and I'm there joking and talking around and I, I pass the tap and I'm bowing and I, on the altar and I'm just having are people going to believe? People are going to be able to see these things. And so our actions, our gestures, our worship of God, first of all, help us to understand who's there. Right? Just like you're going to get to say they're sorry first and they're going to be sorry later. Sometimes you have to start by worshiping God, giving Him the kneeling down and the, and the, and the veneration and the, and the nice rest and the nice speech. Then we'll start believing in our hearts. Or vice versa, right? If we don't act a certain way, we'll start disbelieving in our hearts. And so our job then to come to our Lord here is to speak and talk and love him the way he deserves so that we unveil his presence for ourselves and for those around us. The more I understand who is here, I'm going to treat our Lord with that. And that's why we give the job of that. Right? That's why we give the church the most beautiful we can, that's why we preach best in a certain way. And when we wear sleep clothes, I wear special vestments. That's why the vest the uh, vest are made of gold. Or it's silver or precious metals. Uh, that's why we use the linens to try to keep clean on the altar. That's why we want to make everything as beautiful as possible. Because we're saying, this is God's throne, this is who's here. We want to make it as beautiful and as splendid and glorious as possible. Which I appreciate here. Thank you. Questions, comments? All right, let's close with a prayer. And we'll look then to Holy Communion next. All right. Go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We adore you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for the great gift of the Blessed Sacrament. Help us to recognize this not only with our minds, to adore you in our hearts, and to show you by the way we act and live, who you are, who is present, what we believe. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be ever in the time. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be ever in the time. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise, all thanksgiving, thanksgiving be every moment of my time. The Lord be with you. <laughs> As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.